Okay, Dr. Heiser, my first question is, who wrote the Bible? This is one of those questions where, when I get it, in my mind I'm thinking, do I default to the easy short answer? <laughs> or do I actually give something that's a little more accurate? Uh, we'll try to mix the two. People wrote the Bible. Uh, we could stop there and be accurate, but that leaves people with other questions. Uh, and you know, in, in Emma, in your case, that is probably not satisfactory. So people wrote the Bible. God used human beings as instruments to produce this thing we called the Bible. Now, how does that work? Well, we need to affirm the humanness of the Bible so that we avoid saying things about how we got the Bible that are going to trap us and undermine us later and really do harm to the Bible. Now, when I grew up as a believer, I, I came to the Lord you know, when I was a teenager. And one of the things we were taught about was inspiration. Again, it's a biblical term, you know, how you know, God gave, you know, in, influenced people to, to, to produce the Bible. Second Timothy 3, 16, you know, all scriptures giving by, given by inspiration, theonoustos, it's God breathed uh, in the Greek there. And so that's valuable to know, but it really begs the question like, what is that? How does that work? We know the Bible is written by people because all the books really are different. They use different genres, different styles. They, they vary in, in their grammar, in their vocabulary. What you don't have is you don't have the Holy Spirit whispering the words into the head of the writer. That is called dictation, the dictation theory. And in the circles that I was in as a, as a new believer, the dictation theory actually did crop up now and again. But fortunately, I had people around me, pastors and others, that were smart enough to know that this is not a road you want to go down. And the best place to illustrate it is the, the, the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels. Synoptic Gospels are the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The term synoptic means you can look at them together. They sort of you know, are blendable. And that's because they are often writing about the same episodes, the same scenes, the same dialogues, the same teachings of Jesus. You know, all the Gospels are telling us about Jesus. The first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are highly blendable. They are very, very, very much similar. John is about 90% different, so he gets excluded from this, this issue. You say, well, how does that matter? Well, in the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, even when the episode is the same, the scene is the same, the words are not always gonna be the same. So that tells you right away that the Holy Spirit isn't whispering the words in the ear of the writer, because what does that mean about the Holy Spirit? Oh, I told, I told it to Matthew this way, I'm gonna change a few words when I get to Mark, and then I'm gonna really mess with their heads. When I get to Luke, I'm gonna blend the other two. No, the Holy Spirit is not impish. He's not mischievous. He's not going to lead us to confusion. All right, what happens is that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are writing about Jesus, and they, all three of them, have different audiences in mind. So they're naturally going to select different episodes from the life of Jesus. They might even put them in a different order because they're doing something in terms of literature, literarily, okay? Matthew is famous for this, uh, the literary techniques he uses, because he's building a story, he's building an argument, he's crafting a plot, because he has a very particular audience in mind, and he knows what's gonna have punch in different places to them. Mark's audience is completely different. Luke is writing to Gentiles. I mean, he tells you that in the first four verses. He's writing to his friend, Theophilus. And he's actually using other sources. Luke tells you that too. So you have these differences. And when you have, again, when you, can, when you have scripture that you can compare, it's very easy to see that God isn't doing any whispering in the ear of the writer because they're, they're just different. So we have to affirm the humanness of scripture, which is really a good thing. Let me illustrate it this way. If, I, if, if, you were, if you were a teacher 
Let's say you're a junior high school teacher, or high school, it doesn't really matter. And I've actually had this happen to me in college as a professor. But if you got papers from three different students, and you're reading the papers, and you realize that that's the same paper, what do you suspect? Well, I don't know about you, but I would suspect cheating I would suspect plagiarism. It's a good thing that the Gospels aren't identical because it tells you right away that nobody's cheating. Right? This is something that God providentially prepared each writer in different ways throughout their lives. Matthew was one of the 12, Luke was not, neither was Mark. Okay? Luke traveled with Paul. You know, Mark did something you know, with Paul a little bit, and then with Paul, you know, not with Paul in other cases. They're all different. They all have different audiences in mind, but the Holy Spirit providentially guides their lives, makes them who they are, preparing them for the day when he's going to prompt them, you know, you need to write this down. You need to tell the story of Jesus. It's just like when, when we write books today, you could have a hundred books about World War II. It's actually probably about a hundred thousand books. But each book contributes something. Each book takes a certain facet. Not every book on the same subject, let's just say social media marketing, is going to have the impact with its reader that, you know, they're not going to all, always going to be equal. It's because readers are different. So if readers are different, writers need to be different. Different writers are going to appeal to different readers. And this is a wise thing. This is how scripture is produced. God is in the process every step of the way. Every writer, every hand that would ever touch what we call scripture, you know, something in the Bible, that person was prepared for the task from the time they were born to the time they actually did it by God, by providence, to make them who they were, to put them in the right place, the right time, the right occasion, so they were the perfect person to address this audience, to meet this need, to write this letter, to produce this chronicle of history. They were prepared and they did the job. Okay, think of God as a supervisor. You know, ultimately, God is the one who has to be pleased with the product, and he was. So yeah, the Bible's written by humans, by men, but that is not to say God isn't in the process. God's in the process the whole time. He's just not dropping words and vocabulary and playing with the minds of the readers or the writers and messing with us. He's not doing that. Dr. Heiser, how do we navigate through the inconsistencies in the Bible? Is it historically accurate? Well, my answer to this might surprise you, but of course there are inconsistencies. Again, if I was a professor or a teacher and I got three or four papers and they were identical, I would suspect something is wrong. Now, we, are, we, we tend to think of an inconsistency as an error. Okay, that is an assumption that may not be true. Just illustration. I remember, you know, the first Gulf War, and then of course, you know, 9-11. I knew that these were significant historical events, you know, happening in my lifetime, so I collected newspapers on them. And guess what? No two newspaper articles about the beginning of the Gulf War or the towers, you know, coming down in New York City were identical. There were inconsistencies. In other words, there were details in one that weren't in, it, in the others and vice versa. That doesn't mean that any of them were wrong. It means they were written by different people who selected different facts, different points of dialogue, put things in a different wording. Okay? That's all it means. If your mom and you experienced an event in your life, Maybe, you, you know, the family pet dies. And your mom and you both wrote the account of that. I can pretty well tell that they're not going to be identical. You're going to have things in your version that she doesn't and vice versa. 
does that mean one of you is wrong? Well, you know, in theory it could, but out of the gate you don't assume that. You assume that two people witnessing the same event are going to describe it differently and they're gonna have different perspectives that in the end blend, they harmonize. And this is really what you get in scripture. Now, you know, I can honestly sit here in front of a camera and say that to date, there's nothing in the Bible when it comes to these conflicting you know, discrepancies or you know, whatever term we wanna use, there's nothing that to date has been insoluble, okay? That, that there's no solution to this at all. There, there's, there's no coherent way to put these things together. That is not the case. Now, just because someone can think of a, of a way to harmonize things or deal with you know, certain discrepancies, that's a, that doesn't mean that they're correct. Maybe the, the answer lies somewhere else. But I'm here to tell you that there's no passage that you, know, you, could, you could throw at a scholar where, where nobody has been able to figure out how this could work. That is not true. So my answer to this is we would expect this. We would expect this kind of thing to happen in scripture. We expect writers to take one part of scripture and talk about it and, and, and sort of make us wonder, well, you know, are they using that, that scripture the way it was originally intended? You know, well, okay. You, you say, well, it doesn't look that way to me. We get this all the time when, when, when Paul or somebody else cites an Old Testament passage from the, you know, about the Messiah or something like that. Scholars will say, oh, he's not using that the way it was understood in its original context. So what you're telling me, professor, is that there's only one possible context and one possible way that that Old Testament passage could have been read. Is that what you're telling me? Well, if the professor has any sense, he's gonna back off the claim because we know from, again, intertestamental Jewish literature that Jewish writers took those passages a whole variety of ways. One of which was the way that the New Testament writer took it. So don't tell me the New Testament writer is wrong when he had somebody living centuries before him that saw it the same way. Now the New Testament writer has one benefit that the other guy didn't, Jesus, okay? We have a little bit of hindsight going on there that helps clarify, well, which of the four or five ways that we could take this was the right one. Oh, it's this one because now we're living on the other side of the event. Okay, this is just what happens in the Bible, but we are, we are taught by our culture to act as though there should never be any difference between accounts or that the, the, the Bible, especially the gospels or something in the Old Testament doesn't conform to, to history writing today. You know, the, we, we can't accept what, what the scripture says because there's no other source out there that says the same thing. Or the writer might be biased, or the writer it includes God as a factor here. Well, that's wonderful. Okay, let's take the last one, including God as a factor. If we wanna take that point and say, it's not real history if we make God an actor, so we're throwing out the Bible as a historical source. Well, I guess we have to throw out everything written in the ancient Near East because they thought their gods were in the process too. So let's throw out what we know about Ramses and King Tut and you know, anybody else. It's an illegitimate criterion. It doesn't mar the fact that something happened and they reported it well. Okay, they're attributing a cause, divine cause, Okay. We, we, we can't really judge that, but that doesn't mar the fact of the reporting. What about bias? What about sources? Here's what I like to do. And again, I, you know, I, I, I have a master's degree in history, so I have some training in historical method. I, I, I get it. You know, this, how we do history today is different than how you know, an ancient person would do it. But let's apply our own standards to ourselves. Could I write the story of my own life and have it pass muster as real history. Could you do it? You know what the answer is? No. Because I didn't record every conversation I had with my mom when I was six. Okay? I didn't usher people into the room and say, hey, I'm gonna write this down later and I want, every, I want more witnesses here to validate you know, my memory here. 
I didn't look for, well, mom, stop talking now. I need a, a cross, you know, represent, I need a, a diverse audience here because I don't want to be biased when I, if I ever have to tell anybody this story. Okay, nobody does that. Nobody did it with their own lives. The fact is, Mr. Historian, you can't write the story of your own life and have it pass your own tests. And that is just absurd because we may not have all these other factors in play, but I'll bet that the story of your life that you produce is gonna be a pretty accurate one. It's gonna be faithful to what happened. Maybe we don't have multiple source attestations. Maybe we don't have a diversity of witnesses. Maybe we can't recapture every word of dialogue the way it was spoken in real time. Who cares? Who cares? Our modern conceit, the way we view these things, is not only not workable in the ancient world, it's not even workable with us. So let's get off our high horse and admit that and say, look, these people were trying to recollect and record things that happened. And they did the best job they could possibly do. And when it comes to the Bible, again, God is a factor. Providence is a factor. And so, again, what they've achieved, what they did, was something that God said, two thumbs up, good job, that's going to work. So all these things that we sort of think attack or undermine historicity, turn them back on yourself or the person who's criticizing the Bible. And as it turns out, they can't even do it in their own lives. So how in the world is that a legitimate standard to begin with?